from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the African and Middle East Reading Room. I'm delighted to see you all. I'm Mary Jane Deeb, Chief of the African Middle East Division, and uh, today we're delighted to be able to have with us a wonderful scholar, social historian, art historian, uh, Rosamond Mack, who will be sharing with us the product of her research. We hold these events um, several times um, a month, and we were just talking about how many events do we usually have, and we have about you know 50 events a year. And uh, the purpose of holding these um, programs is to bring scholars like Rosamond uh, Mack today to talk about the work they have done, the research they have done, and the regions they cover. Because as most of you know, we're responsible for 78 countries uh, divided into three sections. So we have the African section, and the African section is responsible for uh, over 50 countries. We have the Near East section, which is quite expansionist. It starts from Morocco, goes on to uh, Oman on one side, and includes uh, Iran, Afghanistan, further, uh, further east, and of course all of Central Asia, and then the Caucasus, Armenia and Georgia, and uh, then we have the Hebraic section as well that covers uh, the, the world in a way uh, where uh, Hebrew and Yiddish and Ladino are spoken. We collect in the vernacular, uh, so for example books on Turkey, in Turkish, would be here. But in English, French, German, they would be part of the, German, of the general collection. So we're divided linguistically, uh, rather than um, nationally or by political borders. And when we invite scholars to come and speak, they demonstrate, they illustrate, in a way, the way this library shares its collections, its scholars, because all the specialists in the division are scholars themselves. Most of them hold doctorates in various fields. Um, and share their knowledge of the societies for which they're responsible. And the purpose is then to bring you back to do your own research and to work with our collections, because we don't simply want to collect those books, to acquire them and collect them at great expense and great difficulty, but to have them be used, be displayed, uh, be enjoyed, and produce more works of research, such as the one we will hear about today. I would like to add uh, a couple of words. First of all, perhaps not all of you know that the head of the Near East section and the Turkish specialist, uh, Chris Murphy, retired in December. He'd been here for, uh, for almost three decades, and he decided to leave. And so we were very fortunate that the library allowed us to, to share, or to have one of its scholars, Joan Weeks, who's here, who's also a Turkish specialist, and who is um, our acting head of the Near East section. And as such, I will uh, pass the baton to her, and she will introduce Dr. Mack. Joan? Thank you so much, Mary Jane. Hoş um, geldiniz. Welcome. It's the traditional Turkish welcome. Welcome to everyone to our very special program today on Gentle Bellini's Drawings of the Ottomans, Italian Art Serving the Sultans. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Rosamund Mack here, 
And I looked through her bio and started thinking of Gentile Bellini, and I find so many parallels to her life story and that of Gentile Bellini. Gentile Bellini was one of the most prestigious painters in Venice at a time when trade had increased in the Mediterranean between Venice and the Ottoman Empire. Sultan Mahmed II was well aware of the art and culture in Italy and had long wanted to have his portrait done in the Italian Renaissance tradition. Gentile Bellini was sent as a cultural envoy to the Ottoman court in September 1479 and not only fulfilled the Sultan's wishes, but he influenced the cultural and artistic traditions of the court. Dr. Mack received a BA from Mount Holyoke College and an MA and PhD in Fine Arts from Harvard University. With her specialization in Italian Renaissance painting, she accompanied her husband, David Mack, a foreign service officer in the Middle East and specializing in the Arab world, to postings all over the Middle East and North Africa, where she gained a unique perspective on the Islamic heritage and the ways that international trade, diplomacy, cultural exchange have influenced the cultures in the region. Upon her return to the US, Dr. Mack has taught at Georgetown University and lectured internationally, as well as worked as a consultant to the National Gallery of Art. Her book, Bazaar to Piazza, Islamic Trade and Italian Art, 1300 to 1600, is a reflection of the synthesis of her prestigious credentials in the Italian Renaissance and her lifetime experiences. Please help me welcome Dr. Mack to the podium. Thank you very much, Joan, for their very generous um, uh, introduction. And welcome to all of you here. And I hope you enjoy the show. Today, my subject is a group of drawings of Ottomans by the Venetian painter Gentile Bellini, which were made for Sultan Mehmed II in 1480 and copies of them. These drawings have raised nagging questions for art historians. How can we distinguish the autographs from the copies? Why are the two drawings, almost certainly by Gentile, the two at the top left, better, more incisive, and beautifully finished than his other known drawings. Why are there so many copies, all the others on the screen? Why did they have no impact in Venice after Gentile's celebrated return in 1481? Why did three of them, the two on the left and the one next to it uh, on the bottom, suddenly surface uh, a decade later at the Vatican in paintings by a Sienese artist for Pope Alexander VI. A re-examination of the drawings in imperial Ottoman context, specifically Mehmed's artistic program and his successor, Bayezid II's political and diplomatic concerns, as well as contemporary Italian events suggest really intriguing answers. Mehmed II, who conquered Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire in 1453, acquired a cosmopolitan culture and artistic taste. He studied the history and art of antiquity, Byzantium, and the Islamic and European worlds. He was especially interested in Renaissance art and technology. A childhood sketchbook preserved at Top Copy on the left, executed when he was about 11 years old, shows an early fascination with portraiture and drawing from life. Though Mehmed's execution is crude, he is clearly aiming to represent things naturalistically. The caricatural heads at the top um, must have been drawn from life, like the birds. Western influence is evident in his choice of the bust format, 
that was standard in antique and Italian portrait sculpture. His use of cross-hatching at the necks shows knowledge of Italian prints and perhaps also drawings. Indeed, he became a collector of coins, medals, and Renaissance prints, including the uh, fantastic image of himself on the uh, upper right, datable about 1460. This is his own unique hand-colored example, and it's still at top copy. By putting a fierce basilisk on the hat, the Italian printmaker turned a profile portrait of the last Byzantine emperor um, in the famous medal just below it into the Turkish menace. So it is not surprising that Mehmed was the first Ottoman sultan to have himself portrayed from life and to commission portrait medals and paintings which he could use in diplomatic and cultural exchange like contemporary and European rulers did. Mehmed used diplomatic contacts with Italian rulers seeking his goodwill to get artists to portray him in naturalistic and idealizing Renaissance style. His first request to the tyrant of Rimini, Sigismondo Malatesta, specifically asked for his renowned medalist Matteo de Pasti. Matteo's medal of the young Sigismondo on the left had brought both of them fame. In 1461, Matteo set sail, bearing a letter by a court humanist that flattered the Sultan's interest in a sculpted portrait which would immortalize him as Alexander the Great had done, really flattering Mehmed, and gifts including a military treatise and a map of Venice and the Adriatic. En route, the ever watchful Venetians arrested him as a spy. So nothing arrived in Istanbul. Probably during the mid 1470s, the King of Naples sent his court artist Costanzo da Ferrara. Little is known about Costanzo other than this superb medal on the right with a very clear message. Mehmed appears vigorous and robust in the profile portrait on the top and in action on the reverse according to the inscription as the thunderbolt of war. Mehmed turned to Venice in 1479 following arduous negotiations ending six years of war when Venice desperately needed to resume the Eastern trade that sustained the state. As the treaty was being celebrated, an Ottoman envoy suddenly appeared to ask the Venetian Senate to send a good painter as well as a sculptor and a bronze caster. The Senate selected Gentile Bellini, the city's most prominent painter who was then decorating the Doge's palace. The Senate had him depart in scarcely a month, together with two assistants each for himself and the bronze caster who was soon to follow. Little survives of Gentile's work at the Sultan's court between his arrival in late September 1479 and his departure in early 1481. His two portraits of the Sultan executed in media customary in Europe, the bronze medal on the left and a painting on canvas at the top right, which is now in the National Gallery in London, were well known in Italy during the following decades. The medal's portrait is quite flaccid, but the imagery includes imperial symbolism important to Mehmed. The three crowns on the verso referring to former realms now in his empire. The canvas, which is dated November 1480, six months before Mehmed's death, 
is in very bad condition and has been almost entirely repainted. Both likenesses and the symbolism were reiterated by other Italian artists, so they were well known. Though Mehmed reportedly kept the painting in Istanbul, a variant uh, below it shows that it was known in Venice by about 1510. While Mehmed undoubtedly inten intended the portrait medals he commissioned to be diplomatic gifts, it is not known whether he actually had and sent the bronze casts. An envoy sent to Lorenzo de' Medici in Florence in March 1480 must have carried a cast of Gentiles or a drawing for it because Lorenzo sent back a medal by his house sculptor, Bertoldo di Giovanni, which is modeled on it. Bertoldo's is on the right. Bertoldo enlivened the profile portrait and on the verso spelled out the territory symboled by the three crowns in allegorical figures behind the uh, chariot labeled Asia, Greece, and Trebizond. Lorenzo certainly intended Bertoldo's medal to demonstrate the superiority of Florentine art and learning, as well as to honor the Sultan who had recently done him a great favor. Mehmed had arrested and turned over the two assassins of Giuliano de' Medici, Lorenzo's younger brother, who had fled to Turkey. The most reliable witness at the Ottoman court, an Italian captive named Amjolello, who had become the prestigious head of the financial department, reported other works which Mehmed specifically requested from Gentile. A drawing of Venice, portraits of persons at court who caught the Sultan's eye, and paintings for the Topkapi Palace. The word Italians then use for portrait, ritratto, also means a drawn representation, normally the first step in portraiture. Indeed, the eight surviving such portraits in Gentile style are small-scale works on paper, the preferred medium in the Islamic world. The seven pen and ink drawings and one painted miniature vary widely in quality, and most appear to be copies of lost originals by Gentile. Questions regarding quality and copies need to be considered in the context of Mehmed's artistic program. On the basis of surviving art objects and the artists named in a 1586 Ottoman history of famous calligraphers and painters, historians of Islamic art conclude that Mehmed fostered a court studio where painters from Italy and Dalmatia, such as a Maestro Paoli and his unnamed Dalmatian teacher, taught artists, local artists, to draw figures naturalistically and to model them three-dimensionally in a European manner. Some copied works by Italian masters temporarily at court, Costanzo da Ferrara and Gentile Bellini. A watercolor at Topkapi on the right with an Eastern style gold background is a faithful, if rather lifeless copy of Costanzo's profile portrait of Mehmed either after the much smaller medal or a preparatory drawing for it that was retained in the studio. The softly shaded face and turban are original, but the garments have been repainted. The miniature is usually attributed to a pupil of Maestro Paoli, Sinan Bey. He gained the honorable status of Bey as the Sultan's painter and may have been the Sinan Bey he sent to Venice as ambassador in 1480. His teacher, 
Maestro Paoli, may or may not have been a painter named Paolo, who, according to documents, worked in Ragusa, present-day Dubrovnik, in the late 1470s, except for a period during 1479 and 80, when a master Paolo received a payment in Istanbul. The seated scribe in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, on the upper left, is remarkably close to Gentile in the shape, drawing, and modeling of the head, the hands, and the uh, sleeves over the forearms. But the heavily repainted blue robe masks and flattens the body. Infrared reflectography, just below, shows that beneath the repaint, the shoulder and upper arm do echo Gentile's very distinctive, weakly structured upper body type, which can be quite disjointed at the shoulders. Um, the woman uh, on the top right, um, the shoulder drooping down in the foreground and the same, the same drooping shoulder in the background of the seated male figure, these drooping shoulders are really most, ter uh, most telling that Gentile is behind these. Uh, the infrared therefore indicates that the artist was working from a Gentile original or that Gentile drew some guidelines for him. But the tubular folds below the elbow on the in infrared and along the hem exaggerate Gentile's drapery forms which again are very characteristic. Um, for example, Gentile's wide sleeves in the painting, painted images on the bottom of the screen uh, fall in arcs, while the, uh, the scribe seems to be uh, sitting on the end of the vertically folded sleeve. Therefore, he seems to be by a different artist. The artist was probably a European rather than a local artist being trained by a European like Sinan Bey. Gentile painted the uh, pictures on the bottom of the screen shortly after his return from Venice, so they're good comparisons. A version of the scribe, which may have been traced from it in the upper center, and on which the robe and perhaps the tablet have been repainted, has been attributed to Sinan Bey, the artist who copied Costanzo below him, or another Oriental. Again, the drawing is competent and mostly faithful to the model. But the image, now a painter, has been further Orientalized by flattening the figure, eliminating the modeling, and altering the pose in accord with Islamic tradition. The artist now supports the tablet on his raised left knee in the back, uh, as happens in this early 15th century miniature from Timur, Persia, to the right. The artist thus reverts Gentile's Europeanized seated figure back to the traditional Islamic type which had informed it. The miniature is now in the Freer Gallery here in Washington. Others in the court studio created a hybrid blend of European verisimilitude and Persian aesthetic and iconography. A portrait of Mehmed II smelling a rose awkwardly joins a head drawn and modeled after Gentile, they're uh, reading from left to right, to a pose which follows Turkmen on the upper left and Timurid bottom left conventions. The crossed legs denote imperial status, while lesser princes and emirs could share the same symbols of rule. The flower, 
the handkerchief held in the left hand uh, on the two bottom images, the dagger and pen knife in the top right, and the thumb ring on the uh, bottom right uh, on the, uh, of, of an archer. Traditionally associated with Sinan Bey, the miniature is now usually attributed to his pupil, Siblizade Ahmed, whose exposure to European art would have been secondhand and who became famous for his portraits. Minus the modeling, this format became the template for official portraits of Ottoman sultans beginning in the 1570s, a standardized type which emphasizes the dynastic identity and continuity of the Osmanli sultans rather than their individual physiognomies. A comparison between the two sheets in the British Museum of Ottomans on the left and two figure studies by Gentile in Berlin linked to a painting of 1496 on the right clearly demonstrates the exceptionally precise drawing, regular hatching, and fine finish of the former. The sheets are truly extraordinary for the brilliant lighting, incisiveness, and polish. They are at once highly appropriate for instruction and practice through copying, which demonstrably took place in the court studio, and as finished art objects for a patron who was a connoisseur of small works on paper, as Mehmed was. The color notes on the female figure, bottom left, uh, in Venetian dialect by an unidentified hand, presage a miniature painted with bright colors, silver, and gold. Scientific analysis of the related group's materials, the paper, the ink, the paints, um, as well as new imaging techniques for revealing layers of work on paper, could determine whether all the sheets, the gentiles, the copies, and the studio versions originated in Istanbul, and how many hands worked on them over time and I hope that a capable team will undertake this. Because the best drawings in miniatures represent figures seated in oriental poses, Mehmed may have envisioned diplomatic gifts to Persian at courts. At some point, a painting of a standing figure dressed in Timurid style was added to the copy of the scribe whose tablet is blank. You see those in the uh, diagonals uh, top right and bottom left. As a whole, the group relates to contemporary Timurid and Turkmen images of single figures probably reaching Istanbul during the 1470s as diplomatic gifts or ransom, such as the pair on the lower uh, right in the style of contemporary Turkmen Tabriz. It is known that in 1472, Mehmed demanded that the ransom of a Turkmen prince be paid in manuscripts and pictorial albums, and that between 1478 and 1481, he received an embassy from the Timurid ruler of Khurasan, which included painters. A number of Turkmen and Timurid images dating from Mehmed's time, at least some of which must have been acquired then, were incorporated into later Ottoman albums. Comparable figures in an Ottoman idiom, such as the seated Janissary on the upper uh, left and the seated scribe on the upper right, and uh, Let's see. And uh, as well as serial copies that were, could be adjusted for specific uh, destinations, like the painter copied from the scribe, would make ideal gifts. Indeed, the gardener scribe 
was probably sent to Turkmen Tabriz because in 1544-45, after the Safavid conquest, it was put into an album assembled there for a Safavid prince. The scribe was back in Istanbul by about 1510 when it was put into an album for Sultan Ahmed I. The Freer's painter came to the West from Iran in the early 1900s. Highly valued works on paper really moved around the Islamic world during the 16th and 17th centuries. The different ethnicities and costumes in the figures by and after Gentile indicate that he believed his patron wanted him to portray a diverse society. Angiolello related an anecdote which reveals an exceptionally intimate relationship between them at a time when Mehmed famously kept himself imperially isolated, aloof, and silent. After scrutinizing Gentile's drawing of a dervish, the sultan pressed him to say what he really thought of the man. Works by Gentile that were used in the court studio's training and production would have been considered the sultan's property. Indeed, the lack of response to this group of images in Venice after Gentile's return argues that they remained in Istanbul. Mesmed's successor, Bayezid II, strongly disapproved of his father's collection of paintings and Christian relics for religious reasons. Angelello reported that he sold all the paintings in the Istanbul Bazaar. The word he used, quadri, refers only to paintings on panel or canvas. Angelello did not mention works of art are portraits or works of art on paper. Inventories of the inner palace treasury taken for Bayezid in 1483, 1496, and 1505 show that, in fact, he kept many of Mehmed's Christian relics and also stored books, manuscripts, and illustrations. At least five times, he made pragmatic use of the relics in negotiations with European rulers, and a congenial Italian correspondent sent him portraits. The negotiations concerned Bayezid's younger half-brother, Cem, who had fled to Rhodes after two failed campaigns challenging the succession. Cem remained a threat to Bayezid in the hands of Christians who might attempt to install him in at least part of the empire during a crusade. He still had a number of supporters there. Beginning with the Grand Master of the Knights of Rhodes in 1482, a series of Ottoman ambassadors negotiated to have him kept under close house arrest in return for an annual payment eventually fixed at the huge sum of 40,000 Venetian gold ducats. Euphemistically called a pension for Chem's maintenance and comfort, it was a very handsome bribe. After the knights took Chem to France in 1483, Bayezid offered a list of relics to King Louis XI if he would keep Chem in France and not permit him to be used in a crusade. In January 1489, Bayezid offered the new king, Charles VIII, two very precious relics if he would keep Chem in France during Bayezid's war with the Mamluk Sultan of Egypt and Syria. The canopy under which the Virgin gave birth in Bethlehem and the tip of the lance, which the Roman soldier Longinus had used to pierce Christ's chest at his crucifixion. After the knights transferred Chem to Pope Innocent VIII, uh, his statue is on the upper left, uh, in March 1489, Bayezid sent two emissary embassies to the Vatican. The first, in December 1489, um, the ambassador Mustafa Bey 
delivered the first annual payment and personally assessed Chim's situation. Subsequently warned by Venice about discussions of a joint European and Egyptian attack, Bayezid sent Mustafa back in late 1490 with a huge three-year payment in advance to sweeten discussion of peace terms. During the lengthy and inconclusive negotiations, Pope Innocent opportunistically acquired about receiving relics said to be kept respectfully in the imperial treasury, particularly Christ's pierced tunic and the tip of the holy lance that had pierced it. Obviously, he had good French intelligence. The papal secretary, Sigismondo de Conti, recorded Mustafa's curious reply. Innocent could not get the tunic because Bayezid wore it in battle to be invulnerable, like his father had done. In May 1492, Bayezid did send the lance head with his ambassador Qasim, who stayed only long enough to check on Chem and be warned by the then gravely ill pope that European powers would retaliate via Chem for any attack on Christian territory a message he would intended to soon send his own ambassador to reiterate to the sultan. For Innocent's tomb on the upper left, Antonio Polaiuolo immortalized the pope, holding the lance head in his left hand. And he had kept this by his bed, in his bedchamber by his bedside during the few remaining months of his life. Subsequent events show Bayezid becoming increasingly anxious and desperate. In August 1492, after an election famously won by bribery, the new pope, Alexander VI, on the upper right, sent an envoy to announce his coronation and remind Bayezid of the annual payment but the ambassador returned empty-handed in early 1493. In June, however, the Sultan's ambassador Qasim arrived with a 90,000 ducat payment to assist renewal of the terms of confinement and peace. Two years maintenance plus 10,000 ducats to present directly to Chem along with some textiles. In his memoirs, the papal master of ceremonies commented on an unprecedented cordiality between the ambassador who conveyed the Sultan's hearty congratulations for Alexander's election, uh, undoubtedly most welcome, and uh, the Pope who mistakenly accepted the textiles as gifts for himself. Other witnesses mentioned unsealed letters, but no other gifts from Bayezid. After Qasim had met with Chem, Alexander dismissed him with a letter thanking Bayezid for, Bayezid for his expressions of amity and requesting non-aggression to demonstrate their mutual goodwill. Did Qasim also give the Pope the gentile drawing on the lower left and the copies uh, also on the bottom that uh, were soon um, used as sources for paintings then being executed at the Vatican, the Borgia Apartments. This was Alexander's personal suite where he and members of his family were portrayed in narratives by the Sienese painter Pinturicchio. And you've got a detail for one of those narratives with the Pope at the upper right. The Ottomans attending the disputation of St. Catherine of Alexandria effectively express hope of a cordial, respectful dialogue between faiths. Both figures after Gentile at the left of the upper image, which shows the whole painting, um, have been given 
more sumptuous attire. You see that in the uh, images on the bottom of the screen. The one on the far left is also missing the plume from his hat, which together with his heavy foul weather gear probably identified him as a member of an elite Eastern European military unit. The Ottoman rider, respectfully observing the event at the far right of the scene, could be a stand-in for Bayezid, since he has the visage and long curling hair of the last Byzantine emperor on Pisanello's famous medal. But he wears Ottoman attire that Pinturicchio could have seen on Chem, an accomplished horseman who exercised regularly at the Vatican. Parenthetically, I want to mention that both the horseman and uh, the standing Ottoman uh, in the turban later became uh, models for images of Chem, really fantastic images of Chem, of whom no genuine portrait is known. The Janissary, witnessing the martyrdom of St. Stephen or St. Sebastian, seems to be an exotic accessory rather than an important actor. Furthermore, he has lost his original identity because he has been disarmed, he doesn't have the cuirass and the bow, and he's acquired, acquired the Eastern European plume. The survival of the rest of the Gentile group in the same collections as the three used by Pitericchio, the three on the top, um, in the British Museum, the two on the left, the Louvre, the three in the middle, and the Stadel Institute in Frankfurt, the two on the right, suggests that Alexander may have received all of the drawings. The plot thickens during Qasim's return to Istanbul when he stayed a week at the court of Francesco II Gonzaga, the Marquis of Mantua, a renowned condottieri, political player, and horse breeder. Diplomatic contact between Francesco and Bayezid had begun in 1491, when a Mantuan envoy went to express friendship and acquire horses. Following the election of Alexander VI, there were multiple exchanges of secret oral messages, probably increasingly focused on Chem, European plans to utilize him, and Ottoman plots to assassinate him. In autumn 1492, Francesco sent a trusted swordsman and courtier with cuirasses, mules, and a painted portrait of himself as a token of devotion. Before his audience with Bayezid, the portrait was passed around the Diwan and admired for its realistic face. In July 1493, Qasim brought Francesco letters from Bayezid and his grand vizier and Turkish style textiles, bows, and bridles. Francesco reciprocated with a gold necklace belt, Italian and Turkish style garments, and a painting of Chem and a Mamluk ambassador in Rome, which, according to the court reporter, Andrea Mantegna, Gonzaga court painter, used to have. Such a painting would have been based on drawings, probably made when both men appeared together publicly, as famously occurred during Chem's arrival in Rome in March 1489. A Mamluk ambassador who had been in Rome for several months saluted Chem outside the city gate, then rode with Chem and his Turkish attendants through crowds of spectators to the Vatican. At that time, Mantegna was in fact working for Innocent VIII at the Vatican. In June, however, he wrote to Francesco that he had observed Chem, but he had not yet had an opportunity to draw him for the Marquis.
Mamluk envoys also visited Innocent in March <clears throat> and December of 1490. Montaigne returned to uh, Mantua in September 1490 after a long illness. So it is quite likely, therefore, that he acquired the portraits rather than drawing them himself. Francesco evidently believed that Bayezid would welcome information on a Mamluk envoy to the Vatican, as well as a likeness of Chem. There's a long history in the East of portrait images being used as identifiers in espionage. After a follow-up Manchurian embassy to Bayezid, in November 1494, Qasim unexpectedly arrived in Venice on an urgent mission to Mantua, so important that he brought the unprecedented number of 40 horses and the tunic of Christ denied to Innocent VIII. Qasim also carried a 40,000 ducat payment, which Alexander VI had requested to help defend himself against Charles VIII of France. Charles was invading Italy to assert his claim to the Kingdom of Naples, solely, he had alleged, in order to be able to launch an attack on the Ottomans from Naples, spearheaded by Chem. En route to Rome, Qasim joined a papal envoy returning from Istanbul. Outside the port of Ancona, enemies of the Pope ambushed them. Qasim relinquished the payment and escaped to Mantuan protection, as Francesco soon reported to Bayezid. Among the papal envoy's papers, soon published by the Pope's enemies in Rome, were five letters Bayezid had written in September. One proposed that Pope Alexander have Chem killed for 300,000 ducats, payable upon receipt of the corpse. Its authenticity remains an open question. Francesco Gonzaga, uh, on the left, dressed as a condottiere, must have been nearly as relieved as Bayezid to learn that Chem had died, apparently of natural causes, in French custody in Naples in February 1495. Bayezid immediately offered Charles some relics for the corpse, but Charles held out for a better offer. Meanwhile, Francesco assumed command of the Venetian component of Italian forces allied against Charles. At the inconclusive Battle of Fornovo in July 1495, he forced the French army to retreat from the peninsula without their rich booty. Francesco commissioned Montaigne to paint this altarpiece, dated 1496, to celebrate the event as a victory. Ironically, the Madonna of the Victory was looted by Napoleon's army in 1797 and is still in the Louvre. Eventually, Bayezid did obtain Chem's remains, which were honorably interred in the garden of their grandfather's complex in Bursa, the Muradia on the right. It became the imperial cemetery for princes slain or kept in solitary confinement to protect the Ottoman succession. Thank you for your attention, and I'll try to take some questions. I'm usually used to using a pointer to help you find things on the screen, but I, I, I can't really use my finger the way you're supposed to with this setup. So I hope you found what I was speaking about. Any questions? Yes. Um, it would seem that the seated figures and 
were certainly done on the inside, and a woman would have been done on the inside. Some of the others look as though they could have been persons on the street, uh, but they were definitely types of person that, uh, that uh, Mehmed II thought were representative of the subject peoples of the Ottoman Empire. He wanted both Ottoman Turks and representatives of the subject peoples in this collection of images. But certainly the painted uh, miniatures, those would have started off as drawings uh, inside or from outside drawings and then been carefully worked up in the court studio indoors with all the materials there. And the usual um, Islamic way of doing figures is they, they had models that they followed and they repeated s sort of models of seated figures, standard figures, and that's the way they put uh, compositions together. So that was their way, um, tradition of doing it. And then with the Europeans in there, that added another element into how they prepared. They go out on the street and pick a couple of people to make the sketch and then bring those sketches back. Yes, the yeah, yeah. That they would be perhaps sketched on the street. Or somebody knowing what Mehmed wanted would catch somebody on the street and bring him into the palace to have the drawing made. Yes? How did the Ottoman court know about the availability of painters in Italy? Did they have cultural anything? Uh, and then what did the painters get from this travel to, to, to the high bank? OK, these are two good questions. First, um, how did Mehmed know about these painters? Well. He got a lot of information from travelers, and he, he had, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say cultural ambassador, he had spies. And um, he got regular, milked regular reports from the Venetians. The Venetians needed his cooperation in trade, and he would milk the bailo for uh, the Venetian consul for all kinds of information. And in fact, this became such a practice that with later sultans and with harem, they would ask for specific gifts that they wanted from Italy. They'd give a list and sometimes drawings to the bailo to get them things. Um, what did they get uh, by going to the court? This is why Italians didn't want to go, because they were scared to death that they wouldn't be able to come home. Um, Gentile made a will before he left very carefully uh, and bound his younger brother to finish up um, what he was working on in the Doge's palace, or he would disinherit him of uh, wonderful drawings, collections of drawings by um, their father. Um, he was, he was afraid that he, he wasn't going to come back. And supposedly, he took uh, one of the sketchbooks with him as a gift to curry favor with the sultan so that the sultan would uh, treat him respectfully. After thinking it over and thinking it in this new context where everything was part of the studio, I think there's a possibility somewhere down the pipe that someone has to ask the question, did Gentile bring out this notebook as part of his working process? And because once it was out, he couldn't take it back, if that's why it remained there. Uh, but the Sultan um, did, they, he did develop a good relationship with Gentile and rewarded him in the end uh, with a valuable gold chain, some honorary titles, uh, garments, I, I assume there was a purse. Um, and the artists, the foreigners, were paid, and they were taken care of. And Mepin took care of them pretty well, but people, Italians, were reluctant to go. Mary Jane.
Gentile. Now, when those paintings of Gentile were seen in Italy, did it influence the fashion? Did, did somehow people add different clothing? Did it influence the furniture and the housing? Was there influence from the Ottoman painting into the? There was, uh, but it's it's a collective. It's not just Gentile. There were many images, particularly in the 16th. During Gentile's time, there was a lack of genuine Ottoman imagery in um, Italy. So that's why i really quite sure that these drawings didn't come back to Venice, because they would have been picked up right away, because uh, the imagery was desirable, desired. Um, but there was a whole slew of images um, over the course of the late 15th and 16th century, which did foster knowledge of Italian, of uh, Ottoman costume practices and so on. And as people, there was more travel, uh, the Ottomans were a spectacle when they came to Venice. People came out to see them. So yes, articles of dress were picked up. Yes. Nobody knows. Nobody knows what he actually painted for the palace. Uh, Angelello describes it in, in a rather suggestive way, um, that there was something perhaps rather racy about them. Um, and certainly Bayezid wouldn't have liked those, so they would have gone right to the bazaar. Um, no, unfortunately, there's nothing. There are... There are people that have connected uh, a drawing of, of a little miniature of a Madonna and child and things like this, but they're not as close to Gentile as this group of drawings. Would any uh, Muslim cleric have objected to the representation of human forms? Uh, was that something that they weren't going to raise? Well, uh, look at look at the um, exchange the exchange of drawings uh, between the Persianate world and the Ottoman world. Um, no, human imagery did circulate, but in a secular context. These are all court figures, uh, warriors, um, genre figures. Stephanie. You said that um, identification of the papers would be able to help you link the drawings to the same artist or at least the same period. How closely have you been able to examine those papers? Um, I can, I'm not capable of doing that. That has to be done by uh, people with the technical knowledge. It's usually done by people in conservation departments. And of course, this, the paper, there could be families of paper, and it's a little difficult to just limit it to the paper because um, a lot of the paper going to Istanbul came from Fabriano in Italy. Uh, so that there is a question whether some of these drawings, particularly the copy ones, were made in Italy rather than in Istanbul. So the paper can help, but you need to look at the whole, look at the group as a whole and not only the paper, but the inks, the paints, and so on. Even more important are new um, imaging techniques coming out through different spectrums of color and light uh, beyond me. But actually, layers of work on paper can be read uh, the way layers of work have been read in paintings for some years. So. Uh, this is a highly technical thing, and I'm hoping there's a little publication on this coming out soon that I can use that to drum up interest at the British Museum and the Freer Gallery to do exactly this study.
Any? Well, thank you all for your attention. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.